Well, good day, everyone. I am Bruce Erickson, the e-learning director for Purdue University Agronomy. Today's topic is lessons learned from technology adoption, moving into the digital age of farming, as you can see on the screen here. We are going to do this in two segments. The first one more about where we have been and where we are now, and the second one more about where we might be going into the future. So let's take a look at the current situation related to precision farming in the United States. Who is doing what and why? What benefits are they incurring from its use? What challenges do they have? One might think that with all of the touted benefits of digital agriculture, that everyone would be using precision farming. But that is certainly not the case. There are some sectors of agriculture where there is very little, if any, precision agriculture used. And what technology are Technologies are used in certain crops and on certain farms can vary widely. Just so you know who you, are, who you are dealing with here, let me share my bio with you quickly. I'm an Iowa farm kid that went to Iowa State to study agronomy and then took a job as an agronomist with Pioneer there in Iowa. Well, that could have been a very nice end to my story after a long career, but after 10 years with Pioneer, I decided that if that alone was going to be it, then I hadn't lived my life to the fullest. So moved the family to Indiana to work on the Certified Crop Advisor Program at Purdue University. Uh, did remote sensing research for my PhD and then uh, worked at ABG in Indianapolis, was with Ag Econ at Purdue, top farmer, site specific management center, and then was hired as the education manager for the American Society of, of Agronomy in Madison, Wisconsin. And there was responsible for the CCA exam and taught online classes. Now I run an online academy with four courses and do work related to the economics and adoption of precision agriculture technologies. I manage the annual CropLife Purdue Precision Dealer Survey, which we'll talk about some here today, and have published some articles about adoption and education related to digital agriculture. So that's probably enough about me for now. For context, it is often helpful to take a look into the past for some of the reasons we arrived at where we are today. Farmers that I used to work with started using computers on their farms in the 1980s. I remember Pioneer, my former employer, sold them at one point. And if you were my age, you may re remember Gateway, the very successful direct ship computer company based in Sioux City that came in that big box with the Holstein look. While these first computers were more about farm management and accounting, a number of farmers and agribusiness dealers then started using electronic technologies out in their fields, such as yield monitors and gridders own soil sampling using GPS about two decades ago or a bit more in the 1990s. That was the start of what most people call precision agriculture, although there were some things happening before then. For instance, some VRT fertilizer work being done in the mid 80s without the assistance of GPS. And you can see that uh, this timeline from an article that uh, I was a co-author on lists some of those technology adoption guidelines here. Uh, you also may remember the handheld GPS units for hunting and hiking that came on the scene um, in the late 1980s. And then um, the combine yield monitor using the pressure sensitive plate was invented in the early 1990s. And you can see that listed uh, right here on this particular graphic. Things were a lot different then, and there have been many changes since. At the start, activities were directed to managing parts of fields versus whole fields using imagery, yield maps, and soil test information to guide fertilizers and soil amendments. Variable rate, P, K, and Lyme applications were the result of a lot of this. Later in 2000, the US government, recognizing the growing value of the military GPS systems for all kinds of civilian use, ended the scrambling of those GPS signals, and that opened the door to many more possibilities. Digital agriculture, Another term that is pretty well synonymous with precision farming, and you've heard me both use both those terms so far today, is viewed by many as our latest frontier for agricultural advancement. This graphic shows a timeline of many of the eras of farming technology. Mechanization replacing much of the handwork was among the first with plows and reapers and threshers, followed by tractors and many farms, all this following the industrial revolution of the early 1800s all over the world. Hybrid development was certainly important, discovered around 1900, but uh, not adopted by corn farmers mostly until the 1930s and 1940s. 
commercial fertilizers in the 50s and 60s, major pesticide advancements in the 60s and 70s, biotech and GMOs came about in the 1990s, which uh, made some huge changes, and also the advent of precision agriculture about that time, or at least the precision ag that we know today. None of these eras, uh, time periods, if you will, really stand alone. They all interact and overlap somewhat. I like to divide precision agriculture into two main groups, a data intense group and an automated group. I mentioned that the initial excitement was in site specific management of fields instead of managing them in the same across all across the whole field. This is a data driven approach uh, where characteristics of a field guide site specific and time specific crop inputs. In the mid 90s, it was excited to begin managing fields piece by piece, but with the tools of the day, many became somewhat frustrated at this data intense process, and for some, the benefits didn't seem to pan out like we thought they would. Part of this is that it sometimes it's hard to see the results pan out in a field. But with today's tools, we seem to be making good progress again in that area. In contrast, the automated grouping is less data intensive with guidance at its root. These results are easier to, to calculate. For instance, if with guidance you overlap your spray less and at the end of the season you have used 10% less herbicide on the same fields, oh, you know that's quickly money in the bank. And with, and with planter row shutoffs, if you plant the same fields at the same rates and end up needing a few less units of seed at the end of the planting season, well, that's pretty obvious too. With a site-specific variable rate approach, those differences are usually not quite so clear cut. So everyone knows that guidance gained traction in the early 2000s, starting with manual guidance and auto guidance then soon followed. The rig in red here has the GPS receiver on top of the cab, you can see that there in white, and onboard computers keep track of location and tell the steering what to do. Before that though, we had to do the steering followed following a series of lights, the light bar on that picture that's inset with the green tractor. It was easy to see the guidance, that guidance quickly provided value mainly in saving costs of fuel and crop inputs, such as seeds, pesticides, and fertilizers. And it was relatively easy to implement, let the tractor do the work. And in addition to the tangible benefits, there were a few intangibles that solidified its role in the farm. Hours following a tillage line or a planter mark is tedious. I have some of these hours logged myself. And so, as they say, if you come in the house at night a little less grouchy, you know, what's the value of that? Uh, maybe probably not too much until you need to call a lawyer, let's just say. And also the ability to work longer hours in dark, in dust, and things such as fog. And soon after we started applying that positioning technology to input applications such as sprayers, fertilizer applicators, and planters, allowing us to turn on and off the boom or planter unit, again paying off quickly, mainly by reducing oversprays and end row double ups, as you can see portrayed in the graphics here, going across um, a waterway or an uneven field border. The value of that uh, was especially big where fields did not have straight borders or fields with obstructions such as waterways or utility poles. At the bottom right here, you can see the clean lines from a planter roll controller and point rows. In the past, a farmer would never want to leave part of a field unsprayed or unplanted and let the weeds take over in those spots. And in addition to the incremental changes of guidance, there were some more transformational changes that were now possible with certain farming systems. In the US, that included strip-till systems, where the strips could be established in the fall, and with guidance, you could come back and plant on those same strips easily the following spring. And mainly in some other parts of the world, guidance was great to control implement paths across fields, which in addition to saving some inputs, it also helped soils and improve yields. This seemed to be more used in other parts of the world that have more soil compaction issues than we do here in the US. The picture here is Australia, where you can see the planting and spraying occur diagonally to this view here, as you can see here, but you can see the harvest activities were staying on these paths. 
And while guidance was helping to more precisely guide our applications, at the same time, our farm equipment overall kept getting bigger and it became harder to apply a uniform rate. Just look at the variation in this sprayer here. We're trying to put on a uniform 25 gallons per acre. And uh, as the key at the bottom right shows, uh, that green is um, a range, but it averages about 95 liters per hectare is what they were trying to put on. In a flat central Nebraska cornfield, this might go a bit more evenly, but it wasn't quite the same in this pieced up Kentucky field that had uneven field borders, waterways, and uh, it looks like probably utility poles in some parts of the field. So the green areas are near the target 25 gallons per acre, but blue is low and purple is even lower at only one third of the right rate. Yellow is too much put on and red is even higher yet at probably a third too much. And so note some of the sore spots. Uh, as we're coming across the little arrows and the black lines here, the direction of travel, note here as you're coming along this uh, left side of the field, if you can see my mouse, we're approaching this waterway. And as we slow down uh, the sprayer, which is a normal situation approaching a waterway, then you can see that um, the spray rate increases. And then after we're through the waterway, of course, what do you do? You throttle up and we're going a little bit faster and the sprayer takes a little bit of time to adjust. Notice also here in some other parts of the field where we're going around some corners. Note here and note here, the lighter rate around the edge, the outside of the turn and the heavier rate on the inside. That's what turn compensation then attempts to do. So, uh, and those must be utility poles, I would guess. So sprayer controls, pulse width modulation, turn compensation, these all work to keep application rates where they should be. It didn't matter so much on the little four row sprayer that my dad was using when I was a kid with drops to put on 2,4-D on the corn. But in a big uh, 120 foot boom on a field, uh, such as maybe was the case here, there. Um, would be quite a difference and these technology gains in recent years are all working to make these sprayer systems work all the better. Our crop life survey substantiates some of what I'm saying about the more rapid adoption of automated technologies. Notice the rapid adoption of guidance here starting about the year 2000 and then uh, in the mid 2000s we started tracking manual guidance and auto guidance separate, separately. Notice the manual guidance and the adoption rate about that time there much high, higher than the auto guidance, but the auto guidance over time caught up, in fact, overtaking that a few years later. So the auto guidance, of course, being the black line here. So now guidance overall is used by the majority of agricultural retailers. Our surveys show around 94% of the dealers are using this. This from the Crop Life survey here of dealers. Section controllers have come on in lockstep, used by most dealers, shown here in green, as you can see here. And coming along at a slower pace are logistics, where dealers use route management to help them know what fields to go to, shown as yellow, and telemetry, where rates and subscriptions, prescriptions excuse me, are, are beamed out to the field and back to the office, shown here in purple. We started asking dealers if they used turn compensation about three years ago, and you can see that about a third of dealers down in the bottom right there uh, are using that on at least some of their acres. Looking at data from the Economic Research Service of USDA or ERS, these data follow a similar trend of relatively rapid technology adoption of automated technology. Here we are looking at the percent of acres, not the percent of agri-dealers using the equipment as was in the last slide. So somewhat different measures. Note every crop is not surveyed every year. That's why you have these different colored boxes in different years. And the yellow square is corn, the blue circle is soybeans, and the brown diamond is wheat. And you can read the key for the others there also. Um, and the most recent data point here is 2016, so a little bit dated. But this is the most up-to-date available from the source, and it's good information. Guidance was rapidly adopted starting in the early 2000s and is now used on most of the crop acres in the U.S. And interesting, these are all uh, different colored icons, follow close to the same path. But these are what I would call broad acre crops or agronomic crops. The story might be somewhat different for vegetables, tree crops, or nursery, or other what we would call specialty crops. And just so you know, throughout this presentation, I will be presenting data for both ag retailers and farmers, so I hope my comments are concise and don't confuse you. 
But while guidance really took off, many became frustrated with trying to site-specifically manage fields with various sensing devices and variable rate technology. Over time, we have been able to figure out some of the complexity of fields. And they're more complex than, uh, than you think as you drive by them. We struggle to see the cost benefit advantage of much of our variable rate work. And so while the more automated technologies took off quickly, the more information intense technologies had a strong start in the 1990s, but suffered through a long period of disillusionment, I'll call it. A guidance system or a section controller on a boom doesn't need to know more than its place in a field and to keep track of where it has been. It doesn't need to know the soil texture, the phosphorus test, or last year's corn yields to do its job. But if you're wanting to put out the right amount of seeds or the right amount of timing or fertilizer in any specific spot, these and many other factors are important to guide those decisions. Because if it doesn't lower the costs or increase the yields or reduce the risks, as the bullet points shown here are shown here, it isn't going to earn a place on that farm. We know that crop yields can have a lot of variability. It's easy to see when looking down at a Google um, Earth image like you see in this particular graphic here. So figuring out how to manage this is key. But while there was some frustration and disillusionment in the past, a lot has changed in how we collect, store, move, and manage data since the mid-1990s. I mean, think of how much technology has changed in the last 20 or so years. And this is all helping immensely. Storage is now remarkably inexpensive. It's getting a lot easier to manage and move around, uh, and processing data is strikingly fast compared to the past. Computer clock speed is one measure of this, now 40 times faster than 25 years ago, if my math is correct, between 100 megahertz and 4 gigahertz. And we're working on turning that data into knowledge. At Purdue, we have had several digital agriculture hires in recent years. One of the most recent is a crop modeler who started in January. And we have great hopes for him in helping us to understand how crops grow and respond to external factors. Another January hire is a person that has expertise in helping to understand the linkages of how plants respond and our measurements of that to the genes that are making that happen, or phenotics loosely defined. Many other universities are making these same types of hires, and we know that there's been billions of dollars and dozens of private investments and in data management systems and data service providers on the farm. The Crop Life Magazine Purdue University Precision Agriculture Dealership Survey is the longest running continuous measure of precision farming adoption anywhere. And yes, it sounds like I'm bragging a little bit here, but we have conducted this at least every other year since 1997, and many of the questions have remained the same so we can reliably track the changes. Purdue and Crop Life got together in the mid-1990s because of Crop Life's extensive reach and coverage through its subscription list. And early in precision farming, agri-dealers in many ways led the adoption of precision ag technologies. Our 2020 results are the cover story in the July 2020 Crop Life magazine, and you can find them also online right now. With each survey, we ask dealers about the precision technologies that they are using in their business, such as guidance and section controllers for their custom sprayers. What are they, they, they using themselves? And then we ask them about the products and services they're offering to their farmer customers such as Gritter's own soil sampling, satellite imagery, VRT fertilizer applications, spraying, those kind of things. We ask them about what their farmer customers are doing, about the profitability of their product and service offerings, and what factors are influencing what they do in Precision Ag. In recent years, we've been asking them a lot more about data, what they collect, and how they help farmers with their data. We're going to talk about all these in just a bit. So. Most of the respondents, just so you know, are from the Midwest, include a mix of cooperatives, independents, and multi-location regional companies that are the crop input dealerships that uh, you're familiar with in lots of little towns all over the country. I mentioned earlier that automated technologies that don't depend on field information, such as guidance, took off rapidly after their introduction. But the more information intense technologies where a single or more often multiple factors in a field are sensed, analyzed, and acted upon have been slower in adoption. This graphic here shows sensing types of technologies. We'll get into VRT next, but uh, the sensing is the first part of knowing how to treat specific parts of fields 
differently instead of treating the whole field or farms the same. So the top gray line is grid or zone soil sampling, as you can see here. And uh, it's a key traditional part of managing soil fertility. So there's the gray line across there. And then the orange line below that would be making a field map or producing a field map for a customer. And so you can see that about a third of dealers were offering these services in the late uh, 1990s here. And that was around half of the dealers maybe a few years after that. Um, and while individual years may go up and down, there was little real upward movement for many years until about 2015, as you can see over here to the right. And then those and other technologies started an upward climb. And I don't have to time, the time to mention each technology, but especially note the swift rise in dealers offering UAV services here, the double blue line. Um, and we started asking about sensor networks a couple of years ago, the start of IoT, and you can see that line there in double purple. And our use is still pretty limited. A part of these, this survey is always to have the dealers look into the future. And we ask the dealers, if you aren't doing this now, will you be offering it in three years? That's the dotted line to the far right. And you can see every single one of these lines is headed upward. And um, that's often the case, though. The dealers um, are usually more optimistic than it turns out to be. But it's still telltale that they feel that more dealers feel like they'll be doing this in the future. So sensing is one thing, but nothing changes until you do something about it. Variable rate is usually the heart of doing something about this. And you could also change an input entirely, or you could change the timing of the input. With variable rate, the graph shows VR fertilizers here in red, um, VRT liming in yellow, VRPT pesticides in purple, and then VRT seeding prescriptions in green. Uh, notice that I said prescriptions on the seeding versus the applications for uh, the fertilizers, limes, and pesticides. And that's because in most cases, uh, farmers are doing their own seeding, but they're relying on their dealer to provide them the information, uh, in some cases, to do the prescriptions here. So, so one other thing I'd note here is for many years, we track separately the single or multiple nutrient VRT fertilizer. It's noted here by the double line and the single line here. And then uh, in 2017, we just ask if they were doing variable rate fertilizer in general. But note the trends are similar to the sensing technologies in the previous slides here. Uh, after uh, some you know, initial uh, upward trend starting in the late 90s and early 2000s, we had a long period here where there was slow or very uh, you know, incremental increases or no increase, in fact, here. But a real shift up in 2015, uh, as we see, as we also saw in the previous graphic with the sensing technologies. In field crops, it's not common for a retailer to do custom seeding, as I said. So uh, let me just mention again that this is VRT seeding recommendations and, and not uh, liming or fertilizer applications or pesticide applications, as you can see here. Uh, and also, like the previous graph, uh, the dotted lines going out to the future uh, are for are not our crystal ball, but they are what dealers are saying they will offer three years out. The survey asks the question, do you offer it now? Or if not, will you offer it in three years? Note all these dotted lines of what dealers are thinking for the future are, all, are definitely headed up. And uh, especially that line for VRT Pest Manager is at a more steep slope than those other uh, red, yellow, and green lines as you can see here. So there's been work with VRT pesticide applications since the beginnings of precision farming, but pests have often been more difficult to assess and quantify across a field. I guess this is part of my explanation why it's maybe lagged in some years past, and because those pests move a bit, they're harder to, to uh, keep track of. They move around more than, than pH and um, seeds and those types of things. But looking at what dealers see ahead for VRT pesticides, this is one of the more interesting parts of this graph. And, and our technology is coming along to help support this.
As we did before, let's also look at the USDA ERS data. That same USDA survey that asked about guidance also asked farmers about VRT. Like the other one, the latest data point on this graph is 2016, and there are a couple of points in 2013. So it's not fully up to date, but a good reference point. This is any VRT, whether it be seed, fertilizer, or something else. And it is by crop, for instance, the yellow boxes are corn, same as before, as you can see here. And the vertical scale is the same as before, percent of acres answered by farmers, uh, not the percent of dealers that uh, are offering the service of you, as you've seen in our precision dealer survey. It's very interesting to note that the USDA farmer survey show very slow adoption of VRT in years past, much like our dealer surveys have shown the adoption of VRT services by those dealers here. So I guess the uh, overall message here remains the same, that VR VRT technologies have lagged in adoption, while automated technologies such as guidance have overall been more rapidly adopted. So that gives you a picture of where we are with precision farming. So while we are making some progress on the site-specific side of precision farming, we do have some room to grow. With guidance and section controllers a maturing market, that growth is likely going to be more on the data-intensive side of precision agriculture. In our next segment, we will look at some of the factors related to this. Welcome again to my palatial office here at uh, Purdue University. So previously we talked about the adoption of precision farming technologies. So now let's look at a number of factors that relate to that adoption and some additional survey results as well as some concepts that relate to adoption. In this section, we will look more into the why factors. They're usually more interesting than the what, uh, helping to explain why certain practices are adopted and some are not. First of all, if farmers are going to embrace this data-rich world, they commonly need some assistance. I don't know of too many that went into farming so they could spend their day sitting in an office behind a computer. A few, yes, perhaps, but a lot will say they enjoy the open air and the freedom to run their own business. So we've been asking far, uh, dealers how they help their farmer customers with data in our crop life survey for a number of years, shown here. So respondents could mark as many as they as, as apply to their situation. You can see that the percentage of dealers helping their customers uh, with relatively simple tasks, such as making maps for their customers and archiving their data for future use has gone, mostly gone up in the last decade, the blue and pink lines here uh, across the top. And you can also see that those that don't help with the data, the green line across the bottom has been going down uh, in the last uh, several surveys here, so in general. So it's a mixed situation after that when it comes to the more complicated aspects of data aggregation and analysis. About half of dealers work with farmers individually with data from their own farms, the orange line, with no aggregation among farms. It's gone up and down a bit. About 20% of dealers do some aggregating of data with customers at the local level and a bit more than one in 10 help their customers participate with a data service provider where data is analyzed outside of that local dealership. And what data has proven to be the most useful in guiding decisions? The green bars show in the graphic here a major influence on the decision uh, and blue having some influence in that decision. And you can see it's mostly with nutrient management, but some also with selecting hybrids and varieties. Note that in the top, it's using data to make P and K decisions, which we, we've been doing in some form on a subfield basis since the mid 1990s. But I was somewhat surprised to see that only 19% of dealers indicating data was having a major influence in variable seeding rate prescriptions. As I have previously showed, two thirds of dealers help their customers with these seeding prescriptions in the same survey. So one has to wonder, are those prescriptions just based on hope or some other factor? But then again, I maybe should not be so judgmental as in addition to the 19% saying that the data had a major influence, uh, as you can see here, another 40% uh, were saying that data from farms was having at least 
some influence to guide their variable seeding rate prescriptions. Probably a much more interesting story than what management practices data is used for is the growing importance of data overall for decisions. I pulled the corresponding graphic from the 2017 survey on the left, so you can see the change in blue and green portions there, um, the sum influence and major influence changes in three years compared to the 2020 information on the right. The combination of the blue and green data at least is having some influence on these decisions nearly doubled in that three-year period. And to me, this is a really big story in terms of our move toward a more data-intensive type of agriculture. And in order to make progress with precision farming, the practice must be profitable. We could do several webinars on the profitability of various practices, such as guidance, variable rate seeding, or the use of satellite imagery on farms. But this graphic shows the profitability for an agri-retailer of various products and services related to precision agriculture that dealers are offering. The green bars, the color of money off to the right there, are those making a profit, those dealers that are making a profit, the percentage of the respondents. Blue is just paying the bills, and uh, you can see some are in the red. In some cases, some dealers just didn't know whether they were making a profit or not, or breaking even, and so that's portrayed here in gray. And uh, for some of the newer technologies, that would sort of make some sense that they may not know. And these were only the dealers that were offering the service. Distinctly profitable for the dealers are those services surrounding soil sampling and VRT fertilizers in lime. And I don't have time to go through them all, so you can go back and look at the slides in your own time or pause this video. But unfortunately, imagery, if you take a look at the profitability of that, uh, one of the great hopes of using that in terms of a site-specific approach isn't as profitable if you take a look here at satellite aer aerial imagery or UAV or, or drone imagery, isn't as profitable as some of the other services. The next three slides I'll go through uh, quickly so you can pause if you wish. Most surveys uh, you know, that we've talked about uh, were, are pretty good at the what, but it's the why that you often want to know uh, to, to tweak your marketing approach to understand the market. So we asked dealers about customer issues affecting the adoption of precision farming. Note there is no information here for 2020. The most recent is 2019. We reduced the survey length in 2020 to make it easier for those that were filling it out. And uh, notice that many of these have uh, bounced around a little from year to year, as you would expect from any survey from the normal sample variation. And for some overall, that the trend hasn't changed much. But note that two very money-related factors, farm income in green here, and the cost of the services in red has been a seesaw up and down over the past uh, several years here. And uh, those uh, factors are more important now than they were just a few years ago. Currently, three-fourths of dealers thought that farm incomes, or in 2019, thought that farm incomes were hurting their ability to grow their precision farming business. Half in 2019 thought that what they were charging was more than the value of the services offered. Lesser factors were soil, crop, or topography issues that may affect how they can grow their precision business. Some of the other lines on the graphic here. And uh, the ability to interpret data and make decisions, the time that it takes out of your day to offer these service, services, and the confidence that customers have in the recommendations that are being made. The survey also asked about dealer issues, what they can charge, equipment costs, employee costs demonstrating value. The higher the line, the more dealers feel it is a barrier to growth of their precision business. These are all money and value related issues. So like the green and red lines on the previous slide, note that these are also in a V or W type of pattern as well. Farm incomes were higher than, higher than now in 2013, 14, and 15. So it makes sense that money issues were less than and have increased since then. We also asked, we asked overall about 11 of these possible dealer issues. So here's a few more for you. I couldn't put them all together as it'd be a spaghetti bowl of lines. But um, high on the frustration list of, uh, I guess, the issues other than the economics is finding good employees to do precision ag. Uh, the line here in red going across, and you can see it's increased in recent years. 
and uh, the changing of the equipment uh, over the course of time in the yellow, as you can see in that uh, particular line there. And equipment that doesn't talk to each other going up and down here in the gray line across, currently half of dealers say that that is a possible impediment uh, for them uh, to grow their precision farming business. The blue line at the bottom indicates dealers overall feel good about the company support that they're getting. And so um, it's fairly low, but if you look at the overall directions in these last three slides, everything seems to be going up, but the frustration levels maybe seem to be going up in the last few years. So these are increasing factors over the course of time. So moving forward, there are a number of factors at play that could help us do a better job in tailoring our approach in a site-specific way. We've really made a lot of progress. The other technologies have come along with what we do on the farms, but a lot of data gathering, moving, and analysis is still very tedious, as those of you that work in this area know. And so some things that we need to continue to make progress in is that um, we need to keep automating as much as possible, assume the technology will keep with us lockstep there. Uh, we need to pay probably more attention to the spatial density and our sampling density and application density. Uh, sensor reading every 10 acres can't well tell us what to do on every single acre. There's a mismatch of the spatial density there. And also a really key thing is we need to understand the agronomy relationship between a measurement and something that can be managed. There's so much to be learned uh, there and that uh, a few years ago, it seemed like we were on top of the world and really understood how crops grow. Now, as we've dug deeper into this, it seems like there's so much more that we need to learn. We needed more production functions for all these possible variants and uh, they all interact as we well know too. So a formidable, formidable task, but I know that uh, many of you that are up, that are listening are up to that task. We also, of course, need a differential uh, response in a field where we're doing things based on sensor information. If there are not different responses to different things that we're doing, we might as well use a uniform approach across a field. Like I mentioned, the data that we collect from a field must inform our approach, whether that be information on soil, soil nutrients, tissue samples, plant responses such as yields, imagery of various types, EC, electrical conductivity, slope and elevation, and everything we have done to a field uh, from those um, as applied maps, if we have those. We must understand those and put that story together to inform an input decision. A lot of our crops and soil information is too coarse to provide accurate information for variable rate applications. And here's an example. This is good at portraying the concept. The yellow lines show the traditional soil survey mapping unit boundaries, but you can see when these are laid upon an image of the land, they don't well match up from what's actually going on in that soil surface there. There's a lot more going on uh, than the mapping units capture. So if a traditional soil map is used alone, and this is just an example. There's other information that's sometimes too coarse or doesn't well relate. You know that they, if we're applying according to this, the results aren't going to necessarily be on target. This particular study from Canada helps us also illustrate this point. And uh, you can see the um, citation here on the right if you want to take and look that up here. The study looked at soil sampling for P, K, and pH in farmers' fields in terms of spatial density and the accuracy of that in terms of informing a variable rate approach. And each dot in a field is a field sample at different densities of samples. Sampling density is left to right with more points to the left and fewer points as we're going off to the right here. So there is no correlation if the dots are on or near the zero line going across the middle. So notice the correlation is higher here with closer sampling points, but goes down as those points get further and further across. So I guess the science behind this is that if samples are close, you are more likely to get a similar reading on a neighboring sample. But going further and further away, it will eventually end up that the readings are totally unrelated. This is a crazy example here. And imagine a series of thermometers measuring the air temperature around the world. 
A thermometer in Springfield, Illinois, will probably go up and down quite a bit like the thermometer in Decatur, Illinois. But there would be much less correlation of temperatures comparing Springfield to Kansas City and even less comparing Springfield, Illinois to Los Angeles. So um, if you can shrink that thinking down to a field scale and nutrient variability, then you understand uh, sort of the concept that I'm talking about here. So to get a good map of a field, the samples should be close enough that they capture that variation. They should correlate to the neighboring samples. If you look at the results in this chart, if your samples are 100 meters apart, which is the same as a two and a half acre grid, there's really little correlation. They're close to that line here. You start getting some correlation at about a 40 meter spacing, um, and there starts to be you know, some correlation there, and that would equate to about every half of an acre with a sample. But with increasing samples, you can see things get better at about 20 meters apart over here at this uh, sampling intensity here. So 20 meters is about 66 feet, 66 feet. Sampling points that far apart, though, needs you would need to take a sample about every one-tenth of an acre. So that's 400 samples in a 40-acre field. And paying for all that sampling would quickly take away any advantage you might have in a variable rate approach. So that's part of why there has been so much interest in on-the-go soil sampling and other technologies to match soil sampling and interpolate with other types of maps to try to get the spatial density more dense. But at the same time, I've seen precision ag work on a huge scale difference. A few years ago, I was on a 120,000 hectare sugarcane farm in Brazil. You know, for easy math, that's about 300,000 acres. They weren't at the time doing much site-specific stuff, but they sure depended heavily on their guidance systems. If you know sugarcane, you don't want to run over the rows uh, when you're going through the field because those sprouts keep coming back up. A few months later, I stepped foot on another much smaller farm in Holland that was also doing precision farming successfully. This was a 120 hectare farm. Just take off three zeros from that Brazil farm or about 300 acres. Um, that's about the same amount of land my dad and uncle farmed together when I was a kid using the same equipment. So they shared equipment. So their need for precision farming was more about validation and keeping their crop inputs exact and where they were and uh, not causing environmental damage. That was their focus in, uh, in Holland there, as opposed to their guidance focus there in Brazil. So scale is relative, and you can make it work um, in different types of situations, I guess is my main point here. I mentioned in a previous slide that retailers see good and good, getting good employees to help with the precision work is a real problem. Here is more information on that. We asked retailers in a different survey in 2018 how long it was taking them to find qualified applicants for equipment operators, agronomists, equipment technicians, tech support, and precision salespeople, as you can see listed there on the left here. You can see some variation in each of the positions there, but the big picture is that you can see a lot of yellow and orange, indicating two to three months to find the right person. It's not always easy to make those precision hires. As another measure, we asked on that same survey for the retailers to give us a read on the skills of some of their recent interviewees. So what is the hiring pool like out there for Precision Ag? The skills we asked about varied, including their overall knowledge of PA. You can see uh, these are listed to the left here, as much as we could fit on the slide here. Uh, their business skills, statistical skills, communication, making maps and recommendations, and you can read the rest of them there. Green meant that dealers said the interviewee had adequate skills, yellow low, and red deficient. Blue is high on the left there, but it hardly shows up. Note that dealers felt interviewees had the lowest capability and a good working understanding of statistics, one of the most important components of data-driven agriculture. The second lowest skill was their perceived ability to install, calibrate, troubleshoot, and repair precision ag equipment. The ability to operate precision ag equipment was their highest skill evaluated of those dealers uh, commenting on their recent uh, interviewees that they had. 
And yet another more informal survey, getting to the economics, is uh, important for future growth here. I asked a room full of meeting attendees a couple years ago back to gauge their view of the economics of precision farming. Two questions. What percent decrease in inputs are we getting now with pre present precision farming tools? The first question here. And the second question, what increase in yields uh, have uh, we been getting using precision farming tools? And um, what are all those tools that we're using compared to if we had to take them away as, a pair, as compared to not using precision tools? And keeping all the GMO tools and uh, other types of things, improved pesticides and uh, fertilizer advancements and all those types of things, this was just the digital ag that I was uh, asking them about here. So... Uh, the results seem reasonable to me, and they, but they actually seemed a little stronger than what I would have said, which is a good reason why it's good to ask the question to see what other people are thinking. So on that first question, what are the cost savings from Precision Ag? You can see that uh, that uh, 10 to 20 percent. I just put them put the results incrementally in terms of 65 people answered, and uh, most of them were in that 10 to 20 percent range. So this might be from controllers on input applicators, guidance, savings from variable rate, where you might put on less inputs on some parts of the field, those types of things. And what do they think they were gaining in crop yields? Again, most thought that they were in the 10 to 20% range here, as you can see from these bars uh, sticking off to the right here. Uh, this might come from reducing crop damage from more accurate inputs. Higher yields where the inputs were just exactly where they were supposed to be and those types of things. We continue on with our discussion about factors affecting our future in precision agriculture. Uh, customer and dealer factors, spatial density factors, profitability. The potential returns. But let me now just point out, uh, bring up some things to think about as I wrap up today. I love this quote from Omaha billionaire Warren Buffett. I wish I would have bought some of his stock uh, 30 years ago, uh, but that's a whole other story here. So, but Buffett says that he would rather be approximately right than uh, instead of being precisely wrong. If you know the differences between precision and accuracy portrayed by the graphic there to the bottom left. If we are doing precision farming, if we're very precise, or we're using digital technology, but we're still way off target then, we really aren't doing ourselves any good. And when looking at the adoption of any technology, whether that be a home appliance, a handheld communication device, anything we buy, an electric car, a house, or whatever, it's not always straightforward what we would do as humans. Because it does take a human to make the technology decision, at least currently anyway. I have always been fascinated by this well-known seed corn adoption study conducted in Iowa, published in 1957. I mentioned at the start of this talk that while hybrid corn was invented around 1900, I guess it was the previous talk, you can see in this graphic that the typical Iowa farmer didn't start using it until the mid to late 1930s. As their adoption here goes from zero to 100, you can see um, you know, these would parallel our adoption surveys from this particular period in time. And the 50% point here is in the late 1930s for Iowa, and other states you can see uh, were even later than that. So from what I remember about the paper, it wasn't that the technology didn't necessarily work well before the 30s, but there was a trust issue involved in its adoption. Um, a farmer may not trust a traveling salesman with seed corn in their trunk to, to deliver off to the farm, uh, but they might more trust another farmer. So setting up farmers as seed dealers, the system that still mostly exists today, was a key part of the adoption of seed corn, as the, one of the main things that this um, paper explores. So tractors are an interesting case as well. Uh, there were tractors being used in the late 1800s in some parts of the Midwest, but why did it take until 1949 for my granddad uh, to be, still be using horses and trade in some horses for a new John Deere MT tractor here? And I have uh, the fortune of uh, my cousin restored this tractor and found the original sale bill um, 
it was purchased at, uh, from a dealer in Rolfe, Iowa, and he's restored this tractor, as you can see here. So, so why did it take so long? Um, and and uh, I guess proof here that uh, that was a team of chestnut sorrel horses were traded in at ages seven and eight. And I don't know much about horses, if that's good or bad, but it sounds pretty good to me. So um, I think part of the reason, from what I understand, is that on small farms in the early 1900s, those big tractors just didn't work very well. They couldn't turn very well. Uh, they had steel tires, which made them not adaptable. As soon as the rubber tires were put on and the smaller tractors came of age then, uh, there was a lot more utility on farms and the ability then to take the grain to market and go over the road and all those types of things. So let me end with a plug for my program here. If you're interested in precision farming and feel like you want to learn more, check out the Precision Agriculture class and our set of online classes at our eLearning Academy. Looking through the syllabus, uh, you can go online to find this. Uh, some of the topics we cover are GPS, GNSS, differential correction, a look at various types of sensors, understanding soil variability, understanding uh, nutrient variability, crop variability, geographic information systems, automation and how that works in digital agriculture, data analysis, telematics, and precision farming economics and adoption there. So, um, you can find a much more detailed syllabus on our website, so just search for Purdue Agronomy eLearning. And this is all developed, uh, delivered in a convenient online format. Uh, you can see yours truly there. They're packaged into short 5 to 15 minute videos that accompany, are accompanied with reading, a glossary, links to learn more, and a test. But I need to warn you, you can't proceed in the class without passing our test at the end of every module. Um, but we work with students to ensure they pass, and all of our 1,400 students so far have eventually passed the test. But you might prove me wrong, and you might be the first one to not pass. I but sure hope not. So summarizing some of what we've talked about today, guidance technologies are mainstream, while information-intensive technologies that depend on sensor data and analysis to help make decisions managing fields are still lagging somewhat, but they're coming on stronger in recent years. We have seen a dramatic uptick in the use of data to make some decisions on the farm, especially with nutrient management. But as we've talked, we still see barriers in finding people to work in precision ag, making various uh, processes easier to do, and dealing with some matters related to scale. Great promise is seen in UAVs and in precision pest management going into the future. And if you're interested in learning more about some of the topics discussed today, here are some links for you. Best wishes to each of you as you implement your precision agriculture programs.